Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. So anyways, this is the Christ of Christmas, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Sometime back, I read a book by Timothy Keller. It was called The Hidden Christmas, and it's The, the Surprising Truth behind the birth of Christ. And in that book, he used an illustration that really caught my attention. In fact, what he did is, is he said that there was a lady at a conference that was speaking, and the lady used a single sheet of paper. And on that paper, she said, I want you to imagine that this represents 93 million miles. And that's the distance between the earth and the sun, just to, to try to get a feel for, here for how, how big that actually is. Now, if you were to go from the earth to the sun with one sheet of paper at 93 million miles, if you were to go from the earth to the nearest star, let's say Alpha Centauri, uh, there's some other debate as to whether it's uh, or Promoxy, uh, Centauri as well, but whatever that nearest star is, you could take a, a stack of papers this thick and pile it up 70 feet, and that would give you about the proximate distance to the nearest star with each sheet of paper representing 93 million miles. Pretty incredible, isn't it? Now, let's take it even a step further because we live in a galaxy which is called the Milky Way, which is absolutely huge. So if we wanted to look at the diameter of the entire Milky Way with light, uh, 100,000 light years across, which is amazing, at a speed of, of light of 186,000 282 miles per, section, per, per second, you would have to take a sheet of paper and stack them 300 miles in the air with every sheet representing 93 million miles. If we were to take that stack and lay it on its side, it would almost get us to Seattle, in between Portland and Seattle. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? And when you think of the, the vastness of this universe, it's absolutely breathtaking. And yet, on the other hand, we've got the minuteness of this universe as well. If you take a microscope and you begin to look through that microscope, you can, you can look down and start seeing all these little things. You get doctors and nurses and technicians that, that, that will look at blood and look into the blood, but if we got really powerful microscopes, we could go all the way to the atom. But now they can even bust up that atom and get on the inside of that atom to subatomic particles. And so, I mean, the universe is vast, and yet it's small. And in the Bible, we find out who it was that made the universe. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Greek word for word is the word logos. And that logos, we come to find out, is the, the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll see in just a moment. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You see the unity of the Trinity, and you see the separation of the Trinity. One God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is talking about Jesus. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now you read just a few more verses, and this is what you find in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this word that spoke the universe into being became flesh in verse 14. This is what makes the incarnation all the more remarkable. You look at how vast the universe is, how small it is, how everything comes into place 
for a purpose. And you realize that the God of heaven sent his son Jesus to come to this earth as an infant. Absolutely remarkable. And that's where we pick up the story today in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Verse 26 says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. And as we pick up the story, we find that, that the angel Gabriel had already come to Zacharias and he had already shared with Zacharias that Elizabeth was going to have child. She, she was going to have a son. They were going to have a son. And so it's on, on that basis, we come to the text today and, and he says, Now on the sixth month, well, what sixth month? It's the sixth month in which Elizabeth was pregnant. Now, if you remember, once Elizabeth found out that she was pregnant for five months, she disappeared. And I've often wondered, why would she do that? You know, you're, you're going to be the recipient of something that only God could do. Why would you go for five months and hide away? And I have to wonder, with her old age and being, being barren all of that time, I have to wonder whether she ended up losing some babies. And she, was, she didn't want to take the chance of one more hurt. And she just ended up disappearing and going into the background and waiting to see if this was really going to happen. But it was at this time that the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary. Gabriel seemed to have a unique role in history, didn't he? In fact, if you go back to the book of Daniel over 500 years earlier, we find that Gabriel went and he spoke to Daniel and he gave him an incredible prophecy, the 70 weeks of years. Now, on that particular prophecy of the 70 weeks of years, it went from a starting point back around the time of Daniel all of the way up to the very birth of Jesus Christ. And so right 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 to the week in, in which things happen. It's, it's remarkable to follow through and see how that did. The 70 weeks goes also, right? You look, in, and it, you look from, from the birth, you see the, the cross as well. He came and he spoke to Zacharias. And as he spoke to Zacharias, he, he shared that his son would be born, but he would be the, the precursor or the pre-runner of the Messiah. He came to Mary and he said that you will be a child. And every appearance that we see with the angel Gabriel coming, he, he comes to, to uh, speak of the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that there's only two angels that are named in the Bible. Do you know who those two angels are? You've got Michael the archangel, and you've got Gabriel. Now, a lot of people say that Gabriel is an archangel. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's some other books out there that, that say that there are as many as four archangels. And yet we've got one archangel, archangel that's mentioned in the Bible, and that's who? Michael. You've got Michael the archangel. He's the only archangel that's out there that's mentioned by name. Gabriel has the special role every time we see him of introducing the Messiah. And it seems that the unnamed angel that was in Matthew chapter 1 was probably also Gabriel as he, he, he went to uh, Joseph and he shared with Joseph what was going on with Mary. Well, it was in the village of Nazareth that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary. Nazareth is a, a strange place. I've got on the map up here to give you an idea. I've, I've spoken with you many times of just how small the area is. The lake you see there is the Sea of Galilee. And just 15 miles southwest, you see the city of Nazareth. You get 22 miles to the west from there, and you've got the Mediterranean Sea. But Nazareth didn't have the best reputation then, and it doesn't have the best reputation now as well. Now, the road to Nazareth, it was just a small town. Uh, many have speculated that it had maybe 400 people that were living there during the d days of Jesus. But it was on a, a road that went down to the city of Sepphoris, which was a, a, a more major city in that particular region. But it also went through Samaria. And so uh, it, it wasn't exactly the, the place that you'd want to be. Nazareth also was about 90 miles away from the city of Jerusalem, which you can see up there. Now, in 2013, when we went to Israel, we had the opportunity to go to Mount Carmel. That's where Elijah went on and, and took the, the prophets of Baal and had a battle with them. And while we're up there, we got to look over, and they had this big agricultural valley below. And we came to find out that that valley was the Valley of Armageddon, that valley in which that last great battle should be taking place at the end of the age. And then our tour guide pointed over to the, well, it was to the, the, the north, uh, I guess the northeast of us. And we looked up, and, and there were hills, and you could see these houses that were on the hills. 
And he said, you see where those houses are? And we looked and said, yeah, we see them over there. He said, that's Nazareth. And I thought, how unusual that Nazareth is sitting on a hill overlooking the Valley of Armageddon. Yeah, you know, I wonder if Jesus Christ, when he was a young boy living in that particular area, ever walked over to that hill and peered down into the valley or even sat there and looked at that huge valley in which the greatest battles in the history of the world are going to take place at the end of the world. And so you had the beginning and you also had a picture there of, of the end. Merle Unger said the title Nazarene was applied to Jesus naturally and properly as def defining his residence. In the process of time, its population became mixed with other peoples, its dialect rough, provincial and strange, its people sedacious, so that they were, were, to, were held in little consideration. The name Nazarene was but another word for despised one. Hence, although no prophet has ever said anything of the word Nazarene, Yet all those prophecies describing the Messiah as a despised one are being fulfilled by his being a Nazarene. The word Nazarene came to mean despised one. I want you to remember back to, to John chapter 1 verse 46. And we had the, the story in which Philip had come into contact with Jesus. And Jesus looked at Philip. He's, he was getting ready to go back up to Galilee. And Jesus said to him, he said to Philip, he said, come follow me. And Philip went from there, and he found another individual by the name of Nathaniel. And he said, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. The one that Moses was talking about is Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Do you remember the reaction that Nathaniel had when, when Philip said that to him? Nazareth? Does anything good come from Nazareth? And that was kind of the idea that it was the disgrace ones. When we were in Israel, uh, we went to see a church. In fact, we went to see the church of the Annunciation in, in Nazareth. And so we came winding through the city, you know, tiny little streets. And we got down to an area that was at the bottom of the hill. And then our, our party had to get out. And we had to walk up this hill. And so we all started heading out. But one of the members of our party wasn't feeling very well. And so she just made it just a little way and had to sit. And her husband stayed with her. So I walked up with the rest of the group up to the church, but I didn't stay there. I turned around and I went right back down. And when I got back down the hill, there was some Arab youths, three of them, that were giving them a really hard time. And so I went and I stayed there. And I was looking around the town and I was thinking, man, I, I wouldn't want to be in this town at night. I don't think it's the safest place in the world to be. And Nazareth was a rough area back in the days of Jesus, and Nazareth is a rough area today. Well, in verses 26 through 27, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. To be betrothed is, is to be engaged but it's even more so than what we would consider engagement today. It's quite a bit more. In fact, if you are betrothed to an individual in biblical times, uh, under these guidelines, you are married to that individual. But you hadn't come to the point of consummation in that wedding yet. You hadn't come together as husband and wife. But it's serious enough that we're going to find that even Joseph and Mary at this particular point were called husband and wife. Now, over 42 years ago, my wife and I got engaged. We had dated two and a half years, and probably the last six months, we, uh, we had been engaged, and I kept losing my orders in the Army, and finally I ended up getting home, and, and we ended up getting married. But that's how we do it today in our culture, isn't it? We go ahead, we fall in love with somebody, we propose, we get engaged, we go ahead and, and, and have the, the, the marriage ceremony, but if something happens in the meantime, you can always just break it off. Well, it wasn't that way in biblical days. In biblical days, when you were betrothed, you were considered to be married under Mosaic law. In fact, if you wanted to break it off, you literally had to go through a divorce proceeding in order to break off your marriage. And that's how serious this is. That's how serious this situation is when we look at, at Mary being pregnant. Well, though a poor carpenter by trade, Joseph was no ordinary man by genealogy. 
Joseph was of the lineage of David, and in fact, he was of, of the kingly line. And I think it's interesting that the genealogy of both Joseph and Mary, both of them run through David. And yet at the same time, on the one hand, we're hearing that, that uh, uh, Mary is related to Elizabeth. And we know that, that her husband is, is a priest. And so it appears that maybe there's some Levitical line in there through, through Zacharias' wife. However, in the case of, of, of Mary, her father came through the line of David. Now, why is that important? Because we find in the Bible the curse of Jeconiah, or in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 24 through 30, it's also called Kuniah, or he's called Kuniah. And what that curse was is that the, the, the kings of Judah had gotten so evil that they finally got to a point in which God says, okay, that's it. After Jeconiah, after Kuniah, no more kings that are descendants of them. So it appears that that kingly line was cut off at that point. Now, if you continue to follow, Joseph was in that line. But that was the line that went all of, all of the way back to Solomon. And so we see that there's two genealogies in Scripture. Have you ever noticed that and wondered about it? If you read through Matthew chapter 1, what you'll find is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And as you follow through that, what you'll see is that the father who's listed there is Jacob, and then it goes all of the way down through Solomon and to David. And so you've got David's son Solomon, the kingly line in the line of Joseph. However, if you go to Luke chapter 3, what you'll find out is as you go through, the father that's mentioned is Heli. And it goes all the way down to David's son Nathan. <laughs> really? I thought the Bible didn't have contradictions. You know, is, is, is there a mistake within the Word of God? Absolutely not. Why the two different genealogies? Because of the curse of Jeconiah, of going around. God in his wisdom had, had Joseph in the very same line that King Solomon and David were in, the kings of Judah. But because of that curse, it was cut off. Now Mary, on the other hand, and the, the, the genealogy in the Gospel of Luke goes through Mary's line, goes around and comes down to David's son Nathan and comes back in and bypasses the curse of Jeconiah. And so Jesus is right in the line for king. Well, Mary was most likely just 14 or 15 years old at the time, and we know that Joseph was really poor because we see that when the time for Mary's purification would come later on and they came to the, the temple to, to make their offerings, what they ended up doing is they ended up giving two turtle doves. Well, for the average person who could afford to get a lamb, they would go ahead and get a lamb, and that's what they would offer. But in the law of God, provision was made for those who were poor, and if they were too poor to give a lamb, then they would give two turtle doves, or they could give two pigeons. For the man who would have been king, it appeared that the glory days were gone. Verse 28. And heaven come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. You see, Mary was not the source of grace. Mary received grace. She was... <laughs> She needed the grace. So often today, we, we just, in Christianity, don't know how to handle Mary. There's, the modern church just seems to be confused when it comes to her. You've, you've got a whole group of people out there that, that look at Mary and they pray to Mary and they see her even as the, the co-redemptress. You see, see worship and prayer that's, that's going on to her. And yet, on the other hand, you've got the Protestants who, because of that, just want to stay about as far away from her as they can. But I think we're making a mistake when we do that because Mary was a unique young lady. She was chosen, if you would. Her womb was the holy of holies on earth as the baby Jesus was carried by her. She was chosen by God with the privilege of raising Jesus. She was chosen by God with the privilege of carrying him and giving birth to him. And yet so often we just look at her and I think maybe, you know, I, th I think maybe we as Protestants need to slow down and take a look at the remarkable faith that that 14 or 15 year old young, young lady had and the things that she did without worshiping her. Verse 28 says, blessed are you among women. 
Well, verses 29 through 30. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Think about this for a minute. Israel had gotten so evil. We've got Malachi in the Old Testament. We've got Matthew, first book in the New Testament. And in between, we've got 400 years. That 400 years is known as the 400 years of silence, even though that 400 years was not silent. It was during that 400 years that the Apocrypha was written in all of those particular books, but we know that they're not inspired by Scripture. It was 400 years of prophetic silence. You see, the, the, during that time, because of the sin, God had just zipped his mouth. After 400 years, God appears on the scene. And, he, and if Zechariah, for that one time in his, his career, is allowed to go into the temple to offer the incense. And he's in there at that particular point when all of a sudden this angel Gabriel appears before him and begins to tell him that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a son. And he says that he is to name that son John. You know, there's a lot in a name. And in today's culture, what we do is we tend to look at names that are popular. We look at names that we like the ring of them or the sound of them. And that's how we choose the names for our children. But in biblical days, so often those names pointed to some characteristic about that individual or some important part about that individual's life that was important for you and me to know and to carry on. And so when Gabriel told Zacharias that you shall name your son John, what he was saying is the Lord is gracious. After 400 years of silence because of sin, the Lord remembers and the Lord is gracious. And that's what the name John means. The Lord is gracious. Now he goes to Mary. You know what Mary's name means? Rebellion. You see, Mary's from Israel. The Israelites had rebelled. And her name, Mary, means rebellion. And the message that he's going to give is that you're going to have a child and you're going to name that, na that child Jesus. And the name Jesus means the Lord saves. Even, even though the Lord, the Lord is gracious, he remembers, and, and even though you're rebellious, now <laughs> the Lord saves. He's sending you a son. He's sending you a savior. So now in our text, the angel Gabriel comes to, to Mary. Why do you think Mary was so surprised at the words that Gabriel shared with her? You know, she's thinking, I've been faithful to my husband. I have never cheated on Joseph. How can you say I'm going to be having a baby when, I, when I'm never even cheated? Well, have you ever wondered why the virgin birth? Why is it that Jesus didn't just show up on the scenes when he was 30 years old? I've, I've often wondered that. I mean, you know, here's, here you've got God manifest in the flesh. Why not just show up as an adult? You come on at 30 years old. Do the things you've got to do. Why the virgin birth? Because it was absolutely critical to your salvation and to mine. Prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Christ wrote this, he said, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, the virgin birth was absolutely necessary to your salvation and mine. I want you to think back into the garden. God created Adam. He created him, by the way, as an adult. That's why I said Jesus could have appeared at 30 years old. Well, he, he created Adam as, a, as an adult. And Adam and Eve are in the garden. And beautiful environment. And God says to Adam, he says, Adam, he said, you can eat of any fruit that's in the garden. Any of these foods, with the exception of one thing. You cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a sign of God's providence. That was the line in the sand, if you would. And so Adam gets in there and everything seems to be going well. He's in the perfect environment. He's got companionship. He's got all the food he could want. He's got all the water he had ever wanted to, to drink. Uh, God is walking with him as he's walking and he's talking and everything's fine. And all of a sudden, one day, Satan shows up on the scene and he begins to talk to Eve. 
and he said what he still says us today, to us today. Did God really say? Did God really say you could eat of any fruit in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Don't you realize that God is keeping his best from you? He bought into it. Crunch. She goes and gives it to her husband, whatever it was. Crunch. Instantly, they die spiritually. You know, what was the promise? If you eat of any tree in the garden, of the, the, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely do what? You shall surely die. Did they die immediately physically? No. But they died immediately spiritually. And they were cast outside the garden. The cherubim were there with flaming swords from that point on. From that time on, every single person who has been born has had that sin nature that was passed on from generation to generation to generation. If we've got anyone who's pregnant here today, you can rest assured that that child who's within your womb, as precious as that child is, already has that sin nature ready to go when they're born. Why the importance of the virgin birth? Because that sin nature was bypassed. You see... Adam had a sin nature that was passed on to us. He was created in perfection, but he was created mutable. What does that mean? He was created perfectly, but he was created with the ability to choose to change. And that's exactly what he did. And so when that sin nature was bypassed, now Jesus is created, and he's going to have to go through the, the tests that Adam would have to go through. And, and we can see that as we read through the New Testament here. But I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and move on. It says uh, the, the connection between Adam and Jesus, the second Adam, can hardly be missed in Scripture. And I think it's interesting that so often as we look in the scripture, what we find is we find Adam is the first Adam, Jesus is the second Adam. Adam is the first Adam, Jesus is the last Adam. Every baby from the time of Adam until the time of Jesus had that sin nature, but the virgin birth bypassed it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 47 says this. It says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man was of heaven. We go to verse 48. As, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we will bear the likeness of the heavenly man. You've got two different individuals here that are, that, that are representative. Adam is the representative of the flesh. Jesus is the representative of the spirit. During Christmas time, so often we sing Charles Wesley's famous hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I don't have the best singing voice, but I'm going to try this, and I'm going to ask if you would sing this along with me here. Okay, you guys ready? Come, desire of nations, come, fix us, us, thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now efface, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Did you catch what it says there in verse 4? Adam's likeness now effaced. you know what that word effaced means? It means rubbed out. It's rubbed out in Christ. That likeness is rubbed out. And now the second Adam from above comes, reinstate us in thy love. Isn't that beautiful that we sing and we miss that so often, that comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam. Now, as Adam was tested in the garden, he was in the perfect environment, perfect temperatures, all the food he could eat, all of the water he could drink, 
companionship. Walking with God. And he had the ability to use his reason. And boy, did he mess up there. Now, Jesus comes along. Jesus walks up to John the Baptist. And he says, I need to be baptized by you to fulfill all righteousness. John says, I can't baptize you. I'm not even worthy to untie, untie the sandals that are on your feet. Jesus said, it's got to be done to fulfill all, all righteousness. And so he goes through the baptism. As he's coming out of the water, the Spirit comes upon him like a dove. And the very first thing that the Spirit says to Jesus and directs Jesus is to do what? Go in the wilderness and be tempted. So now the second Adam is sent out into the wilderness to be tempted. It's not the most lush environment. It's desert. It's horrible out there. There's not any food to eat like was in the other garden. There's not any water to drink. There's not companionship most of the time unless the angels would, would appear occasionally. And then Satan came to him at his weakest point. Then he begins to challenge him with the very same challenges. You know, if you are causing doubt, but instead of using human reason and human logic, do you know what Jesus did? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And Jesus had victory. I think that's important for us to remember today when the enemy comes and he starts whispering in our ears that we just need to, to, to go back to thus saith the Lord and go back to the word of God. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. There is so much in a name, as I shared earlier. In fact, if we look at the name Jesus, which we usually say, is actually the Greek word. It's the Greek word of the Hebrew word Yeshua, and actually the English word today that we use is Joshua. Now, each of those means the Lord of salvation or Yahweh saves. But we can miss something really significant on this whole thing. Because if we remember back to the period during the Exodus, we see that Joshua, after the death of Moses, ended up taking the leadership of Israel, and his role was to take the Israelites into the promised land. So Joshua led the Israelites, he led God's people into the promised land. Now, if we go up a couple of names and we see Jesus, or if we see Yeshua, what do we see? We see Jesus bringing the children of God into the ultimate promised land, into heaven. And you've got all of these connections within the Word of God. It's so exciting when you begin going through and you see how everything begins to fit together. Do you realize that every time you say the name of Jesus, you're telling people the good news of the gospel. You say the name of Jesus, what you're saying is, the Lord saves. The Lord saves. You know, God, Yahweh brings salvation. He is salvation. Verse 32, and he will be great and will be called son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. There's two things that we learn in verse 32. Number one, he's totally God and he's totally man. In his divine nature, Jesus is the son of God. In his human nature, Jesus is the son of David. And we've got both elements of that that are playing together here in the Christmas story. Verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You see, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. You think, well, what in the world is the Davidic covenant? It's this. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So often as we look through the Old Testament, we see some of these prophecies. You know, we kind of scratch our head at it because we don't see how it all fits. But an illustration that's really helped me out a lot is this. It's uh, the parallel ra railroad tracks. Now, just for a moment, I want you to think you've got two sets of railroad tracks, I almost identical, going the same direction. But what we find in biblical prophecy so often is that like parallel radio, or railroad tracks, we've got two meanings here. One is the here and the now, 
and the other one is the ultimate meaning in the end times. And so when we look at the Davidic covenant, we see that David did have a son. That son's name was Solomon. Solomon did go on and he built the temple. And we see later on it even talks about punishing them if they get out of hand and everything. But there was a, there was a bigger prophecy that was tied together with that. And that's that there was going to be an ultimate son of David who was going to lead an, uh, an eternal kingdom. And that would be the upper railroad track in there that, uh, <clears throat> that that's eternal son was going to lead the eternal kingdom as well. Well, verse 37, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? You know, she wasn't doubting the angel like Zacharias was. Zach Gabriel comes to Zacharias. It's like, yeah, right. Yeah, you're, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to give me a sign because, you know, my, my wife, she's too old to have a baby. I'm too old to have a baby. You're going to have to give me some kind of a sign and zip. He's, he's quieted down. But when Mary talks, she just simply says, how, how can this be? How will it be fulfilled? But the answer was ultimately in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit would overshadow her and she would become pregnant. Now, I think it's important to note in here, the story of this virgin birth is pretty tough and it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. I think it's important that we remember that Luke was a medical doctor. Luke had seen many births before as a doctor. He had been, probably been involved in a whole lot. And we also know of Luke that he's one of the most accurate historians in the history of the world. Today, people look at the writings of Luke and they use them. They go to the promised land. And you find archaeological digs because of the accuracy of, of, of his writing. Uh, you can look back and see just how accurate this medical doctor was. And as we're talking about the virgin birth, who did God choose to record that story? He chose a medical doctor and who, who would know that this was no ordinary birth. This was completely different than anything that had ever happened before. But this pregnancy created some real problems for Mary. What would the people think? Joseph was gone. In those days, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, there was no telephones in order to be able to communicate. Today, something happens, I find out on Facebook half the time before I actually get a call or find out something's going on personally. But back in those days, it was word of mouth. And so all of a sudden, it was during this time that word comes out that Mary's pregnant. How's Joseph going to react to all of this? There's a lot to a Jewish wedding. Um, it's interesting. I told you that to be betrothed means that they had gone through a process and actually had gotten to the end of the process that you're seeing here on the screen. But number one, would the bride price be accepted by the bride's father? Now, in those days, many of the marriages were arranged, and it's possible that Joseph and Mary had had their marriage arranged as well. But what would happen is when it came time, the, the prospective groom would come to the, to the bride's house to the father and would have to present to him a bride price. And you wonder, well, why would that be required of an individual if he wants to marry a young lady. Well, number one, it served the purpose of, of proving to the father that the young man would be able to provide for the needs of his wife. Number two, back in those days, it was an agrarian society. Everybody was involved in the farming, and if you pull somebody away from the family, that would put a strain upon the rest of the family. And so, in that sense, you've got compensation, financial compensation to the family for, for taking the young lady away. She's not going to be able to work any longer. Number two, let's suppose that the bride price is accepted by the father. Well, the next question is, would Mary drink from the cup of wine? Well, what would happen, I'm going to pick on my wife, what would happen is if the bride price were accepted, it was probably at a dinner, the young groom would take a cup of wine and he'd walk over to the young lady that he was proposing to and he would set that cup of wine right in front of her. And from that point on, it was totally up to her whether she picked up that cup of wine and drank from it or whether she left it sitting on the table. If she picked up that cup of wine and drank from it, <laughs> That's her saying, I'll accept the proposal and we'll be married. If she was leaving it there, then that meant I'm not going to be married to you. So let's say that, that Joseph goes over there, Mary picks up that glass of wine, she takes a sip of the wine, and she says yes. Well, what happens then? 
Well, now the young man has to go back to his father's house, and he's got to prepare a place for her. Now, we see that in Scripture in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, where it says, In my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. Now, I want you to think about Joseph. If it were me, I'd be in trouble because I'm not mechanically inclined at all. It's going to take me a long time. But Joseph's a carpenter. This guy knows what he's doing. He would probably head over there and be back as soon as he could to get that bride of his. Except for one thing, we find out that it wasn't up to him. In fact, a lot of the young guys would do, but it, it was up to the father as to when the groom could go back and get his bride. Mark chapter 13, verse 32 says, No one knows the, the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. You think, now wait a minute, Jesus is saying this. We believe that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. How can God, who's a mission, not know the day nor the hour? Well, Jesus has two natures. He's totally divine. He's totally God. And he's totally man. In his divine nature, as God, he's omniscient. He knows all things. Yet in his humanity, he knew what the Father revealed to him. And in this imagery of the Jewish wedding, it was up to the Father as to when the Son could go back and get his bride. Well, it was during this time of separation when the two of them were apart that all of a sudden rumors began flying that Mary was pregnant. She was in a really, really difficult spot because she knew she had been faithful to Joseph. And yet, what would Joseph think when he heard the rumors of the things that were happening that, that she was pregnant? How would he respond? The penalty for adultery, even among those who were betrothed, was stoning by death. And she knew that everything was on the line there. How would he respond? Well, Joseph was troubled. I mean, he knew he had been fine. He hadn't cheated. How, did, how was it that, that Mary had become pregnant? In fact, we find out that he was so alarmed, he's considering in his mind quietly divorcing her. He's going to quietly go ahead and set her aside, and he's going to go on with his life until he's visited by an angel that tells him exactly what ended up happening. So she's in that tough spot, but Joseph is an honorable man. And she's got to be thinking, how, how can I possibly be pregnant when, when I haven't known a man? You know, no one had ever, ever gone through this before, this overshadowing by the Holy Spirit. But now we find the angel just clarifies it to her in verse 35. And the angel answered, and he said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. In other words, this is something that only God could do. It's not something that any man could do. That virgin birth was absolutely necessary in order to bypass the sin nature. Jesus came as an infant, not at the age of 30, because he had a lot of things he had to do. Virgin birth, sinless life. Do you realize that the sinless life of Jesus Christ is every bit as important as the virgin birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension? Because Jesus had to live his entire life, the, the testing. Jesus had to live his entire life sinless in order to qualify to be your Savior and my Savior. And as he did that, he left us with the example of how to get through the, the attacks of the enemy. Thus saith the Lord. Verse 35b says, Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born of you will be called the Son of God. This child was no ordinary child. This child was totally God and totally man. Mary's womb, once again, was the Holy of Holies with the baby Jesus, Emmanuel, on the inside. Verses 36 and 37, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. <laughs> 
Gabriel comes to Zacharias and he tells him what's going to happen. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. We're, we're, we're really old. Uh-huh. I want a sign. Well, you just zip it up and you close your ears for the next nine months. And we find out at the end of that nine months he learned his lesson. And when the people were asking him what should he be named, he came out and he said his name, wrote his name is John. And instantly it's opened up. Mary never did that. Mary was saying, you know, I don't understand it. God, I'm going to trust you. I, I don't know how that's going to be. She didn't ask God for a sign, but God gave her a sign anyways. That sign was her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who was way beyond childbearing age. Mary, Elizabeth is pregnant. She ha is having a baby. That was the sign to show Mary that in God, all things are possible. All things are possible. That should be an encouragement to you and me with the challenges that we go through in life. If I, if I were to, able to get into each of your lives right now, I bet just about everybody here has some major challenge that you're going through in your life. And at times we get overwhelmed when we see the things that are happening and we wonder, God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? And sometimes we just need to learn that if we trust God, he's going to develop us and help us to grow through those times. But we need a word of encouragement even today that with God, all things are possible. And Mary got that through Elizabeth. Verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, it, it, it amazes me the maturity of Mary for being 14 or 15 years old. I'm guessing she's somewhere in that area. And, and she, she's never gone through anything like this, but she's willing to trust God that that's the way it is. She's going to put her, her trust in, in no matter what. And when she addresses back to the angel, she addresses herself as your maidservant. Now, we need to understand that's the, one of the lowest, most humble ways that she could ever refer to herself, that she was a servant, that she was a slave, that she was a humble maidservant. And Mary turns around rather than questioning the angel like Zacharias did. And instead she said, so be it. Let it be so. Last night, Cheryl and I watched a real dramatic movie on TV. It was one of those really hard movies to watch, and maybe some of you out here have seen Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know uh, how many have seen it, but boy, it's, it's tough. And it's about the story about Desmond T. Doss, who was a medic during World War II. He, uh, he, he was a, a Christian. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. And he had a couple of incidents when he was young. One time, his, his father used to just allow his brother to beat him. And one time he got angry and he took a brick and he hit him right in the head and just about killed his brother. And another time, his father was beaten on his mother and he wrestled with his dad and he wrestled the pistol away and he put that pistol on his father's head and something refrained him from pulling that pistol. But he made the, the covenant that he would never pick up a weapon again. Well, he started watching the videos of World War II and all of the things that Adolf Hitler was doing and other people were going into the war and even though he was a conscientious objector, he didn't know how he could, could get involved until it dawned on him through a series of circumstances that happened, I could be a medic. And he talked to the recruiters and they said, sure, you can be a medic, you won't have to pick up a weapon at all, sign him up, send him off to basic training. He gets to basic training and they hit a point in training where now everybody's got to pick up their weapons. And when it came his turn, he said, I, I can't do it. They began to put incredible force upon him to the point where they even got into blanket parties. If you have been in the military from years ago, you probably know what a blanket party is. The whole platoon would be punished because he wouldn't pick up that weapon to fight. And then make them run, then make them do all these exercises. They made their life miserable. And when that happens in the middle of the night, what a blanket party is, is when the individual is sleeping, somebody takes a blanket and a whole bunch of people, they throw it on top of them, and they pound that person to a pulp. And that's what they did. And he refused to pick up that weapon. Well, through a series of some more circumstances, he was allowed to go without a weapon. 
And so he had it over, and it was one of the bloodiest battles that they had in World War II. It was to retake Okinawa. They had this huge cliff, and they had ropes that were going up, and as they went up, the Japanese were hiding in, in caves, and they would just come out of the ground in flocks, and they were just slaughtering the Americans. And it got so bad that at one point, all the Americans had to run. People were shot all over the place, and they get to the net, and they get down there, and he's still up there, and he hears Americans crying for help. When everybody else was running, there was one person who wouldn't run, and that was Desmond Doss. And so it was almost as if he, he was spending his time in his prayer, he was taking his Sabbaths, and, and it was almost as if, well, everyone else getting killed, God was protecting them, the bullets were going all over the place. That man, under the most horrible circumstances, one by one, pulled 75 Americans to safety personally, by himself, dropped them down that huge cliff. And yet, he kept going in. So, it, it, he had won the respect of the troops. And so, he's back down there, and the very next day, after everything he had gone through, he found out that he was going to have to go up again because the other medic was killed. But it was the Sabbath, and he refused to go until he had his time of prayer. And uh, the general, or whoever was in charge back there, is telling them, get up that cliff. And the men refused to move because they saw what God did through him until he was done with his prayers. And he went up top again, and, and finally he ended up getting wounded and ended up coming back down. But he's one of the, the incredible heroes of World War II. President Harry Truman ended up giving Desmond Doss the Medal of Honor. He saved men physically. But, you know, we looked at that Jesus Christ came on a rescue mission as well, too, didn't he? Desmond Doss was on a rescue mission. Jesus Christ came on a res uh, rescue mission. Desmond Doss was trying to save men physically, but for Jesus Christ it was so much more difficult than what Desmond had to do because the people were dead spiritually and they needed to be saved. Jesus came as an infant. He lived that sinless life. Desmond Doss received a medal of honor. Jesus Christ received the cross. How much does Jesus love you? He loves you this much. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, that the Father sent the Son. He sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Why should Christmas matter to us? What should Christmas mean to us? It should mean everything because God sent his son from heaven to this earth as an infant to begin the process to bring you and to me by grace through faith in Christ to salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the birth of Jesus Christ, which brings a hope that cannot be taken away for those who put their trust in him. Lord, you sent the greatest gift of all in Jesus. And I pray now for, for anyone here, Lord, who's never received Christ as Savior, that not another day would pass. Lord, it's the most important thing a, a person can do in their life is to receive Jesus and what he did for us on the cross at Calvary. I ask, Lord, if there's someone here who's never received Christ, that they, they might pray a prayer like this, realizing it's not the words that save, it's, it's the heart. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. We believe that you died on the cross for, for my sins, our sins. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I, I repent. I change my mind. I change direction. Lord, I ask that you would come into my heart and my life and help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Yeah, my